Okay, okay. I'll be discussing Domestic Ideology and Persuasion by Jane Austen. Okay. In the 19th century, society applies to the notion that women and men occupied separate spheres. Women occupied the domestic sphere, whilst men occupied the professional sphere outside the home. Um, we can't really begin looking at domestic ideology without looking at Mary Wollstonecraft. Wollstone, Mary Wollstonecraft's The Vindication of the Rights of Women um, ruptured the domestic I, um, ideal. Her writing is published shortly after the French Revolution, a significant point in that it was a time where there was a lot of social changes being made. Um, Wollstonecraft acknowledged that it wasn't just male chauvinism which was to blame for women's downtrodden position, but it was also women themselves. And I thought that this quote's very good in relation to persuasion. She says, My own sex, I hope, will excuse me if I treat them like rational creatures instead of flattering their fascinating graces and viewing them as if they were in a state of perpetual childhood, unable to stand alone. I wish to persuade women to endeavour to acquire, stre uh, acquire strength of both mind and body. That's on page 13. I thought it's really interesting in relation to persuasion because persuasion is about this idea of resisting um, other people's influence and conforming to other people's standards and expectations. Okay. In persuasion, Austen uses her characters to externalise the problems encountered within the domestic threshold. Domestic issues vary from marriage, motherhood and the role of women. Austen ensures that she does not alienate her readership by maintaining a self-restrained and controlled narrative voice. Domestic issues are subtly raised within the text. From the outset, Austen shows how the absent mother figure ruptures the domestic ideal. Lord Elliot is unable to manage the household without his wife and has consequently driven the family into financial ruin. It's also interesting to note the solution to the financial difficulty is represented by the prospect of remarriage. Again, female participation within the household is imperative. Lord Elliot also seeks the guidance from Lady Russell, who acts as a substitute mother, figure asserting control over certain situations and managing the family affairs. We also see how the domestic sphere rules and governs the lives of women. For instance, Mary may have to forfeit her invitation to a party due to her son's illness. And she says, so here he is to go away and enjoy himself. I'm the poor mother. Am I to be allowed to stir? And yet I'm sure I'm more unfit than anybody, anybody else to be around the child. And Persuasion's written in 1819. And what Austin's picking up on here is the fact that women and men, are, there are complete different social differences between the two. Um, women have to remain at home. This is the problem represented in Mary's situation. And she also says on page 53, nursing does not belong to a man, it is not his province. A sick child is always a mother's property. Her own feelings generally make it so. Again, there's this divide between genders. Um, Marion Reed um, was noted that women can negotiate their domestic role and use their position within the household to influence and impart wisdom onto the future generation. Marion Reed is writing um, 20 years after Austen and she's promoting the domestic ideal. And she says, she alone can make a fireside scene of happiness and improvement to all of those who approach it. She alone can clearly show her children that the paths of wisdom and virtue are also those of pleasantness and peace. She alone will be able to be um, solicitous to aid mental development as to care for their physical comfort. Um, in Persuasion, Austen also shows how women can use their influence to transform and change situations and circumstances. For instance, Anne's sister Mary praises Anne's influence over her son Charles. She says, did you just hang on me? You can make little Charles do anything. Um, he always minds you at word. Women can regenerate society um, by using their influence to impart wisdom. And she also goes on to say, um, Anne acknowledges herself to be the first utility to the child. It is this type of moral authority which Marion Reed is acknowledging, although Austen herself isn't necessarily promoting the domestic sphere. She 
is raising, these, uh, raising this issue that women can, in fact, have a pivotal role within the domestic sphere. In persuasion, Austin also shows how women can use their influence to change certain situations and circumstances. Um, oh, sorry, I've already said that already. Um, however, persuasion is not necessarily the right course of action. Lady Russell's acts of persuasion hinder progression. By the end of the novel, Anne regains control over her own life and resists conforming to the expectations of others. Women are fortified by independence. Arguably, Austin is challenging conventions without causing too much controversy. Um, Womanhood in Jane Austen novels offers an interesting interpretation of Austen's fictional representation of women and domesticity. It is written by Sylvia Myers. Ian Watts expresses the opinion that Austen renders women in subordinate position and renders male superiority the norm and dramatises these social positions for both men and women. He says, her novels, in fact, dramatise a process whereby feminine and adolescent values are painfully educated in the norms of the mature, rational and educated male world. And that's on page 225 of JSTOR. Um, in other words, what he's saying is, Austin adheres to the values of a patriarchal culture um, in that her literature implies the stereotypes of femininity and masculinity. Critics have challenged this line of inquiry, most notably Sylvia Myers herself, who, um, who also states that Austen did not want to alienate her readership that avoids the controversy Wollstonecraft and other contemporaries ignited through serious subject matter. Myers criticised Ian's argument that Austen did not offer solution to women's lack of position within the 19th century. This is Myers' response to that criticism. It seems very difficult to discuss Jane Austen's attitudes towards men and women without seeming to acquiesce in, in the dichotomy what finds masculine equated with adult, with the mature, rational, educated world, feminine equated with adolescence. Interestingly, Maya's argument is that we cannot avoid the subject of separate spheres presented in Austen's fiction. However, she argues that her novels are about the struggles in women's lives and she is completely dismantling Ian Watts' interpretation. Um, Maya's argument goes on to point out that Austen's works focus on a set of interiors. Her interest is not decoration. She often shows her heron responding to the interior in terms of its life and vitality and its bearing on future possibilities. The heron herself is seen as a woman whose fate is in the process of being decided and a world of interiors. What kind of interior world is to be hers? Is she to be left empty or to be unfulfilled? To be cherished or to be merely used or used up? The language used draws the image of the closed and confined domestic world, which is referred to as a world of interiors, closed, unopened and limited. Again, Austin's heron is unable to evade the domestic life. Her fate is always in the process of being decided. Austin herself remains unmarried and childless. And th th therefore, in a way, she's almost rupturing this domestic ideal. Um, a close reading of the end passage in the novel supports Meyer's inter interpretation that Austen focuses on the interior world inhibited by women. Um, in a discussion with Captain Wentworth, Anne describes the interior and domestic world. On page 213, she says, Yes, we certainly do not forget you so soon as you forget us. It is perhaps our merit, our fate rather than our merit. We cannot help ourselves. We live at home, quiet, confined, and our feelings prey upon us. You are forced in exertion. You have always a profession, pursuits, business of, of some sort or another to take you back into the world immediately. And continual occupation and change weaken impressions. Here, Anne abandons her passivity and meek persona. This is perhaps one of the most thought-provoking speeches throughout the entire novel, again raising the issue of the domestic life. Um, she outlines the trials and tribulations of the female sex and the unjust social differences between men and women. Her portrayal of a woman's role is one of pure domesticity. She notes that the duties are confined to the household, whereas men have an external role, one that accommodates their professional needs and desires. Women have suppressed dreams, whereas men can pursue all their worldly ambitions without compromising their respectability. Um, the use of the word fate projects a harsh reality that 
that women lack control and independence over their own future lives. Interestingly, the external world, outside the domestic world, is seen as liberating, whereas the home itself is horribly limited. Now, I personally would argue that Austen is trying to um, show how the domestic world is unfair and unjust, although she also is showing how pivotal women's role is within that domestic sphere. Um, and overall, her own life would suggest that she is trying to steer clear of, con of a conventional um, route and maintain her views and opinions. Unlike Wollstonecraft, she isn't controversial and maintains, um, gains her readership by not, by not evoking that controversy. And, and that's it, but I have listened to my bibliography at the end as well. Thank you very much, Francesca. Okay. Um, can I just ask you before you go, um, so are you, are you saying that she, she is more radical but she does does it in a subtler way. That, yeah. She's as radical as Mary Wollstonecraft is what you I think she's she's just as radical as Mary Wollstonecraft, but she does not go about it in the same way. She's she's very subtle, whereas Mary Wollstonecraft um, uses very serious subject matter. Austen keeps it quite mocking. She's sort of mocking the values of uh, patriarchal culture, but doing it in a subtle way, which doesn't really spark criticism. Okay. So did, did, did Jane Austen read Wollstonecraft, as far as you know? Uh, not as far as I know, but, but writers were aware of Mary Wollstonecraft so because it was such a... What you're saying. Yeah, I think, I personally think she would have probably encountered Mary Wollstonecraft's opinions. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. That's lovely, thank you, Okay, I'm going to do a piece of this.